York Times calls it a fresh, provocative, and engrossing account of the abolition movement. Uh, they're referring to a new book, The Color of Abolition, How a Printer, a Prophet, and a Contessa Moved a Nation, by best-selling author and legal scholar Linda Hirschman. Uh, in it, she chronicles the movement that ended slavery and the abolitionist who led the campaign. And Linda is here with us now to discuss not just the book, but also a really interesting Atlantic article in which you sort of say that we could learn lessons from the aborish aboriginalist's toolbox, if you will. Um, the Contessa is Maria Weston Chapman, wealthy white woman. Um, the uh, printer is William Lloyd Garrison, uh, printer of an abolitionist newspaper, and the prophet is Frederick Douglass, which I think most people should know, American hero and civil rights activist, if you will, former slave. But I want to talk about the parallels that you see between the abolitionist movement, that time in American history, and what we're seeing today in terms of the threats that we're seeing to democracy, the misinformation that's out there, are there similarities? There are such strong similarities mm. that it's haunting. Mm. Uh, you know, I call myself Cassandra because I started writing about the abolitionist period and now we're living in a parallel universe. Um, we are divided. That is the most potent parallel. We are divided to bedrock. We disagree about where we get our information. There is no more profound disagreement than that. <laughs> True. We disagree about ideology, what kind, what makes a good life, right? Does male dominance and white dominance make a good life, or does a multiracial democracy make a good life for people? We're divided about how to govern ourselves and each other, and we're divided about learning, so that one side of the divide in America embraces education and scientific-based knowledge, and we're divided, just like in the abolitionist period, between the cosmopolitan north and the rural sections of the country and about how to make a living and whether you want to participate in a dynamic economy that thrives on learning or whether you want to participate in a static agricultural-based economy or a rural-based economy. Those divides, do they sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Right were the same things that divided us in the run-up to the Civil War. Mm. The difference is that in the run-up to the Civil War, there was the indigestible issue of slavery. So that's my question about it, it, that indigestible question of slavery. In your piece, you write that the fault lines of today's political divides go back even further than the Civil War. But, but one of the, I mean, the issue around slavery, a lot of it was tied to economics for the South and, of course, of the birth of the new country. There were states that were deciding where, how they wanted to become a member of the United States. What are the stakes today? Because it feels like when we talk about the divide, it exists on social media, it exists on cable news. But I wonder if the divides are stark when you are talking to your neighbor or when you're talking to somebody that you're friends with who may have a different opposing view politically from you, as opposed to people really ready to take up arms in 1861? So the, you know, people are looking at that. We have the best of all polling, voting. And the voting reflects a deep divide between a very right-wing Republican Party and the Democratic Party. And we are divided almost 50-50. Look at the United States Senate almost exactly divided. So we know that people in the privacy of the polling booth are indeed divided similarly to the way they were in 1860. We know that from the election returns. Mm -hmm. We also know it from weird things, like um, there was a recent poll that reflected that Democratic young people don't want to date Republican young people. They don't hmm. want to date across party lines. This is so familiar to me because the uh, divides in the abolitionists in the run-up to the Civil War, people, families split and neighbors split. So it was not possible to bridge it. The really interesting question is, is slavery the difference between armed confrontation mm -hmm. and uh, this constant fussing at the edges of our divide right now. And I don't know the answer to that. It is, in fact, true that race is the mortal sin of the American Republic. And accordingly, it goes from 1619, let's say, just to pluck an example from sure. the ether, to the present time. 
So you can't, I think our divides now would not be as potent as they are if it weren't for the issue of race. The difference, in my opinion, is there isn't a geographical boundary. There's no Mason-Dixon right. line right. between the um, Democratic Party uh, part of America and the Republican part of America. So it's going to look more like Lebanon or Ireland mm -hmm. than like uh, um, Fort Sumter. Yeah. Uh, and I, but I don't know if there's going to be violence. There was violence on January 6th. Sure. And um, the, so in the run-up, so let me, let me give you some good news, okay. okay? The good news is the abolitionist movement has taught us how to, has taught progressives, just to be very frank about my approach, how to resist the retrograde half of America. And you list in your, in the Atlantic article, you list a number there, there of are. steps, mm -hmm. organization, Printing. Printing. Printing, I thought, was really interesting. And I guess that could be extrapolated to the, the airwaves, right? Right. It's printing for the abolitionists, because that was us, sort of a brand airwaves. new thing. But our new technology has been social 100%. media. 100%. Right. It is media technology, yeah. right? Media technology is huge. It was in the Protestant Reformation. Rode in on the back of the invention of movable type. It's always something. In our case, it's social media. And one of the things that the Democrats have never learned how to do since the Obama campaign used it so well is how to use it. Well, in the last 14 years, they haven't used it well. It is meeting. It is talking. It is retail politics. It is not being bullied. It is so important that the uh, people who believe in a, an interracial, self-governing democracy not allow themselves to be bullied by the But you know, it's interesting. Our... I asked former Senator Al Franken about that. I said, why are Democrats so bad at hitting back? Because the Republicans had no issue using the kind of language that they use, Correct. using the technology. President Trump was famously, his Twitter feed was dangerous. Um, and he said, we're just not like that. That's just not our MO. And I just sort of thought to myself, well, if that's going to be the answer, then you're constantly going to get beat by Republicans who figured out a way to use that tool. And one of the things that Frederick Douglass did for the abolitionist movement is he told the story. I have come to tell you a thing or two about slavery, he said. And he told the story of how terrible slavery was. And it put steel in their spines. Those mm. fugitive slave narratives were the movement literature of abolition. So what we need now are people to tell us how bad life can be when there are laws against birth control and laws against abortion and laws against talking about race in school and so forth. What that life will be like to put steel in the spines of the people who resist it. So fast. And you, and you, you, you pointed to the Dred Scott decision as being a galvanizing idea, much in the same way that perhaps we're facing a moment with Roe v. Wade. It is possible that the Supreme Court, which is completely in the hands of a non-democratic, with a small d, non-representative faction of the American politics, will in June issue an opinion that is comparable to Dred Scott. The question is, do American women whose rights are being stripped from them have the same resolve that the enslaved black people had in 1857 and 1858 and the free blacks of the North who were central to the abolitionist movement. When Dred Scott came out, they said, that's it. Any fugitive slave that gets North, we're going to try and rescue them and send them to Canada. And they succeeded a lot. Let me ask you a really quick question before we let you go. Um, you know, you talked about that tool toolkit, right? Uh, the use of print, the printing press or technology, social media, um, the, the airwaves, meetings. Um, isn't that what we act? I mean, weren't both sides using all of these tools, if you will? And why then do you think we saw what happened on January 6th occur? Or, or maybe we saw sort of a parallels. Maybe, in, you know, on one side, we saw people gathering in the streets to, uh, to protest uh, uh, discrimination and police brutality and all, that, all those protests that we saw on the streets. 
And then we saw, not that there's a parallel, but then we saw what happened on January 6th. Were both sides using the same tools, but to a different end? Both sides are using similar tools. Mm -hmm. And this distinguishes it from the antebellum period, because the South wasn't that good at using the technology. Someone once said, if farmers go to war with engineers, the farmers are going to lose. And that's the story of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. So it is true. You, is you that are the story exactly of misinformation right. nowadays? You, you know, they, there was was the use of media technology. The, the strategy, and I do not compare the Black Lives mm -hmm. Matter protests mm -hmm. to, okay. But, um, but the both sides now have figured out what the tools are. But um, as Vlad said, the Democrats aren't so good at using mm -hmm. them. And what I'm trying to say in The Atlantic and in my book is, here they are. Mm -hmm. Use them mm -hmm. and use them well. Retail politics is very important. Stacey Abrams proved that. And the abolitionists did it with their petition campaigns. They went to people's houses and asked them to sign petitions, and they converted them one at a time. So the Democrats can do that. And at the end of the day, I always ask the same question, which is, what's it for? Mm. Maybe their tactics look similar, but one side is on behalf of an undemocratic, retrograde, white-dominated vision of the American future, which looks a lot like the American past, by the way. Mm. And the other side is, as Barack Obama said, embracing an aspirational vision of America, the country that can do this hard thing that can make a multiracial democracy, not so common in the world. So I think we need to distinguish not by who's got people in the street, but by what are they trying to achieve. It's a fascinating article in The Atlantic and the book. Uh, congratulations on it. Thank it's you. a lot of food for thought. Uh, really, really interesting. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Uh, be sure to check out Linda's book. It's called The Color of Abolition, How a Printer, a Prophet, and a Contessa Moved a Nation. It is out right now.